This is episode 98 of the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and in today's information-packed interview, I'm speaking with author MJ Evans. MJ is an award-winning, best-selling author who graduated from Oregon State University. She spent five years teaching junior high and high school students before retiring to raise her five children. She is a lifelong equestrian and enjoys competing in dressage and riding in the beautiful Colorado mountains. The Sand Pounder is her 20th book. Most of her books are centered around horses or horse fantasy creatures. Now, let's get into the interview. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast, a podcast featuring interviews with equestrian authors who love all things horses and writing about them. In each episode, you'll hear inspirational stories from horse book authors, including writing advice and marketing tips to help you write your very own horse book. If you're an author, aspire to be an author, or simply love horse books, then you are in the right place. I'm your host, Carly Cade, and creative writing makes my spurs jingle. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and I am so excited to welcome MJ Evans back to the podcast today. Hi, MJ. Welcome back. Hi, Carly. It's good to see you again. Wish we could be in person. It's much more fun to be with you in person. (laughs) I agree. We do have a lot of fun. MJ and I have galloped around at several author events together, including the Equus Film Festival at the Kentucky Horse Park. And it's been a minute since we've seen each other, but we definitely have fun and we've stayed connected and we're always supporting each other's books. And I'm excited to have you back on the show because today we are talking about your 20th book. So I'm excited to talk to you about this because I understand a lot of research went into it, but also to talk to you about longevity, uh, how an author keeps that motivation to stay creative and keep rocking it out with the books because building a backlist is one of the most important things an author can do to support their career and bring in more income, right? Would you agree with that? I would agree with that, but it also helps you to become more more interested in your own work Mm. you're doing a variety of things and I've done that by you asked about longevity I've done that by trying different genres they're all kind of horse related (laughs) you know my the mist trilogy is horse fantasy the centaur chronicles horse fantasy but my in the heart of a mustang contemporary coming of age novel then there's Pinto and the Sand Pounder, which are historical fiction. And then I've even tried my hand at some picture books, <laughs> working with illustrators. So I think if you keep yourself fresh and try new things, you're not going to get into a rut. I love that. But you also expand your audience that way. Mm. You know, a lot of my audience our horse people. My first books were nonfiction trail guide books for Colorado. Mm -hmm. It happens that those readers of my trail guide books and buyers and users of my trail guide books in Colorado also buy my fiction books. They buy the picture book for their grandkids. They buy the, um, you know, Pinto and In the Heart of a Mustang for their for themselves or for gifts or for teenagers they're written for young adult and adult and then when I had the launch party at Dover Saddlery all of you are familiar with Dover Saddlery it's a national company they happen to have a brick and mortar store in Parker Colorado which is where I live and they are always stocking my books on their shelves they are so good to me But not only do they do that, but whenever I come out with a new book, they host a launch party and Mm -hmm. have a party at their store. Well, who comes to the party? Those original buyers of my trail guide books. So I think you keep yourself fresh and you keep your readers on their toes because they never know what you're going to come up with next Mm -hmm. by trying different genres. And my current favorite genre is historical fiction. And I know we'll talk about that some more when we talk about the the sand pounder. 
Yes, your newest book. And I think you just shared a wealth of knowledge there. But what I like about what you said is you're trying different genres and different styles of writing because even the picture book and children's book is in trail guides and you've done a little bit of everything, but you've kept it all centered mostly around horses. So you're Uh staying true to the the readers of your books. And as a horse person, I know I'll read nonfiction, I'll read uh, biography, I'll read fiction, I'll read, you know, I'll read anything. And I pick up trail guides and children's books are always something I gift my nieces. So there's always the, the relatedness of the horse is the core of what you've created with your backlist, which I think is really excellent advice. And then before we get on to, you know, what's next here is my next question is, how did you create that relationship with Dover Saddlery that they've supported you through 20 books and always host you a launch party? Because I mean, A, it's local, yes, but did you spend millions of dollars in, on tack for your horses at their location? <laughs> Is that how this happened? <laughs> okay, so yeah, which one of you out there does not spend millions of dollars on tack and blankets and clothing? And, you know, I mean, even my horse shirt, you know, yes. <laughs> you know, we're it's an addiction. It's mm-hmm. very sad. But <laughs> I developed the relationship by going in and talking to them. Mm. I started approaching them about the trail guide books. And the trail guide books are for Denver area. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're well, except the fourth one is riding Colorado and beyond. So it's uh, the states around Colorado as well. But but basically it's for horse riders in Colorado. So when I wanted to sell that book, I didn't even put it on book one and two are not even on Amazon unless somebody's reselling themselves. They are just sold through tack and feed stores in the Denver area between Fort Collins and Colorado Springs. So that geographic area. Mm -hmm. And I just got a little case that held five of the books. And I walked into the tack and feed stores and I asked them if they would sell my books. And I said, and I will guarantee you can return if they don't sell. Well, my first printing was a thousand books. They were sold out in three weeks. Wow. I had to reorder. I reordered 2000 books. Those were sold out in less than a month. And just in that small geographic area. Mm -hmm. So you know, any of you who are interested in writing, if you really want to sell nonfiction and romance (laughs) are kind of the two biggest sellers and nonfiction sells if you fill a niche Mm -hmm. and you fulfill a need for that niche audience. Mm -hmm. So my niche audience was horse people in the Denver area. I fulfilled a need because we have so many fabulous fabulous trails but people didn't know where they were and it's just not enough to go in and get a hiking book that has a little horse symbol on it that's not good enough for horse people Mm -hmm. we need to know what the parking lot's like we need to know if there are water crossings bridge crossings mountain bikers hikers with backpacks on we need to know what we're going to face when when we get to that trail I went to some trails that were just, I couldn't even park my trailer there. Mm -hmm. So I had to leave, even though the trail was open to horses, according to the Forest Service. Well, that doesn't do us a lot of good if we can't get in there. So if if you're interested in riding and really selling, write to market. Mm -hmm. Who is your market? And in that case, it was trail riders in the Denver area. Still sells like crazy. Though I now have four of those books and they sell like crazy. Oh yeah. As a trail rider, I completely associate with what you're saying there. I mean, you need to know the terrain. Some horses are not good with mountain bikes. And if the trails are excessively busy and the parking is very important. So you definitely fill the need. But I also like not only did you fill a need, you went hyper local and started with your audience there. Now, I imagine people coming to Colorado would pick up this book who are bringing their horses to ride, but you started very local. And so don't overlook the power of local, your local community and what you can do with your books inside of your community. And it doesn't have to be a book, a bookstore, right? I didn't sell them to bookstores at all. Although Borders, when the first book came out, picked it up at their local stores. Now Borders doesn't even. I miss Borders. I used to love Borders. Yeah, I used to love it. (laughs) They picked it up. But the generally, 
go where your buyers are going to be. Mm-hmm. Now, where are buyers going to be? They're going to be at Dover. Mm-hmm. They're going to be at Murdoch's, a, a local um, feed store. They're going to be where they're spending their money because <laughs> we horse people are really good at spending money. <laughs> and they're going to be where they buy feed, where they buy clothing, where they buy tack. And those are the places I went to, not a bookstore. And those books have sold like crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. And if you want more information about MJ's trail riding books, we go into uh, uh, go into those in depth in your uh, previous episode when you were on the show before. So I'll make sure to link to that so people can learn a little bit more because you actually did the research and went into these trails and rode them yourself, which leads me to because we, we kind of skipped around a little because that was a great conversation that just organically happened. But tell listeners a little bit about your history with horses and how it motivated you to step into the world of writing horse books. Okay. Now, I would say if you're going to jump into the fiction world, mm-hmm. start with something you're passionate about, mm-hmm. something that you love and that you're a semi-expert on. It's not to say that everything you write about, you're going to be an expert on. There is such a thing as research, Mm -hmm. which you have to do even for a fantasy. But when people read my books, they know that I know and love horses. And so horse lovers are going to relate to that. Mm -hmm. People who love history are going to appreciate the history research. But people who love horses are going to appreciate the horse knowledge that's in the book. Now, I was born with manure in my blood to a (laughs) non-horse family. My poor parents could not figure this girl out. I didn't want to do anything but be with a horse. And my mother was a ballet teacher. I was the worst student in the class, the one hanging on the bars and making faces in the mirrors. I just wanted to be with a horse. So um, finally, When I was eight years old, I started taking English riding lessons. By the time I was 10, I was taking twice a week, a flat class and a jumping class. And by the time I was 13, I bought my own horse with my own money. Impressive. And I had to support him myself. My parents didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so I had to work to support my horse. Before I was old enough to get a job, I clean neighbors' houses. I babysat on the weekends. I walked polo ponies at the stable. I did whatever I needed to do to support my horse. I never got in trouble because I didn't have time. <laughs> and, and I certainly didn't get waste any money on clothes or makeup, as you can probably tell by looking at me. But I took care of my horse myself. So now this was how many 50 some years ago. So I would make like 50 cents an hour babysitting. So everything's relative, you mm-hmm. know, as, as the salaries go up, the prices go up. So it all ends up the same in the end. And now I was really blessed that right in my town was a uh, chapter of the U.S. Pony Club. When I got my own horse, I discovered there was a big gap in my knowledge, and that was all the horsemanship stuff we need to know. So I am so grateful to Pony Club for the emphasis they had on horsemanship and taught, and they taught me how to care for my horse. It's the never ending process. We can always learn new things, and everybody has different opinions. You know, the old joke is if you get five, horse women in a room, you'll get six different opinions. (laughs) So there's a lot to learn. And it's a process. Absolutely. You still are a horse owner today, which which I also love. But I love how you took all that knowledge. And then you brought that to writing your books, which is something you love. And and I'm glad that the Pony Club taught you the horsemanship, because that is really where the I believe the true connection happens. It's not just getting on the saddle or getting on their back and riding. It's the the grooming, the, you know, the, the checking them out, the bonding time, the, you know, knowing how to put the tack on the horse and then uh-huh. all the lessons learned through just being responsible for an enormous animal, like gives you a lot of, a lot of depth to work with when you go to write books and you've written 20 of them. So let's <laughs> talk about your, and I love that they're all horse based, but in you've worked with different genres. I, I think that's so amazing. And it's a good way to stay fresh, like you said. So let's talk about your 
newest book, The Sand Pounder. And what inspired this book? Yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing is, uh, whenever I go do an author presentation at a school or a writing club, writing club, not writing, <laughs> they always ask me, well, where do you get your ideas? And it's funny, and you, I'm sure you could attest to this. They, they come in the strangest places. It's not like I sit down in my chair and I say, okay, let me think of an idea to write a story about. It doesn't work that way, at least not with me. I agree. The ideas come in stra at strange times in strange places. And this book actually came when someone sent me a photograph of one of the original sand pounders, a black and white photo. They sent it to me on Facebook and said, hey, Margie, write a book about this. So I started looking into the sand pounders. And those of you who don't know, if you've never heard of the Sand Pounders, you are not alone. Mm -hmm. Most people have never heard of the Sand Pounders. I haven't heard of the Sand Pounders. I'm, yeah. I'm intrigued. What's a Sand Pounder? <laughs> I know. Isn't that interesting? Yes. The Sand Pounders actually existed during World War II from 1942 to 1944, kind of mid-42 to mid-44. The U.S. Coast Guard had a mounted beach patrol yeah. that they named the sand pounders and they put a call out to horsemen all over the country to join this division of the coast guard to protect the u.s from invasion and there was there were legitimate reasons to be concerned you know we have, had been attacked in, on december 7th 1941 in pearl harbor mm -hmm. but not only that the japanese uh about six months later, also shelled a fort along the Oregon coast called Fort Stevens. Mm -hmm. And so people on the West Coast and on the East Coast felt very vulnerable. And so the Coast Guard was called upon to protect our shores. And they put together the Sand Pounders. And there were 3,000 riders at, at the peak that would patrol the beaches on the East Coast, West Coast, and in Texas. Now, of course, they couldn't patrol all coasts on horseback because some are, you know, you, that a horse can't go along. You know, they had to be a beach. They couldn't be a rocky cliff. Right. They also had to be uh, beaches that were accessible to a horse. But they patrolled those miles and miles of, of coastline. You know, when they put out the call for riders to be the sand pounders, they had a few people who are already in the Coast Guard or in the Army or Navy that were horsemen that switched over to be a sand pounder. But most of the sand pounders were cowboys and <laughs> show jumpers and jockeys and horse trainers, you know, horse people from around, horsemen from around the country. Well, you notice I said horsemen. Mm. They didn't take women because they felt it would be too dangerous. Women were allowed to do certain things, like they were allowed to man the lookout towers mm -hmm. along the coast, but they were afraid that the sand pounders might have to engage in actual combat. And so they weren't allowing women. So my story uh, is about a girl named Jane who lives in Tillamook, Oregon. Now, I picked Tillamook, Oregon, because it was close to Fort Stevens. Mm -hmm. It also was the home for the blimps that were built and sent out and patrolled the West Coast. And so there was a lot of war issues going on in that area. And when I was a girl, I grew up in Oregon and mm -hmm. lived there until I was 45. And my dad, who served in the Second World War briefly, would take us up to Fort Stevens to an area called Battery Russell, and he'd show us where shells had hit, had landed and where that had been hit. And he told us about things during World War II, but he never said a word about the sand pounders. Wow. He never said a word about them. <laughs> but they were very uh prominent on the in the or on the Oregon coast mm -hmm. and in Texas. That was another place where there were a lot of them. New England, no. But further south, along the East Coast, yes. 
but they were in reality trained over in Hilton Head, South Carolina, and at a fort in Pennsylvania. But because this is historical fiction, mm -hmm. I could create what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And there was a Coast Guard station close to Tillamook. So I had Garibaldi Coast Guard Station on the Oregon coast be the site for the training in this book. And I had Jane disguise herself wow. as a man. She just graduated from high school and she disguises herself as a man, changes her name to John, mm -hmm. and she joins the Sand Pounders. Oh, I and love she, it. She, of course, is the best little Sand Pounder out there. <laughs> but this is not unheard of for women to disguise themselves as mm -hmm. men in order to uh, join. Have you ever heard of Joan of Arc, for example? Of course, and yes. Of course you have. And then during the Civil War, there's a, several examples of women who wanted to stay with their husbands during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So they disguised their, themselves as men so they could fight alongside their husbands. So it's not unheard of for that to happen. But she becomes a great sand pounder. Now, a funny thing that I did in this, you know, you've got the fiction here, you know, for example, the fact that she disguised herself as a man and there's no record of that happening in the sand pounders. Mm -hmm. and that I set the training in Tillamook, which isn't where they would have trained. <laughs> but at the same time, Tillamook, at the end of the book, where they phased out the sand pounders, they auctioned off the horses. And they, Tillamook, had an auction at their fairgrounds for some of the sand pounders' horses. And they sold the horses at the highest average price of the whole country. Oh, wow. So Tillamook was involved in this. And so it was a logical place to set the story. But, uh, and probably some of you have heard of Tillamook cheese. I know, I was going to say best yeah. cheese ever. And they yeah. make ice cream and they make right. ice cream cheese. <laughs> I love right. I love so you know that name Tillamook. Mm -hmm. and, and so I mentioned some of those things in the book because that Tillamook cheese factory has been there for a long, long time. Wow. That is amazing. I mean, I love this. There's a whole lot to unpack in what you just shared there, but but one, I love I love that we're still uncovering the way horses have been connected to humans and helped us through all the greatest moments of our lives, whether they're good or bad. You know, from cultivating fields to getting us across the country from the east to the west to being a sand pounder, which is something. But I think horse people are going to be fascinated to learn about because this is new. And you, as a writer, get to bring these stories to life, but also re because it's historical fiction, you can reposition things like you put it in Oregon, which is something that you're close, that you're close to, you're familiar with, you grew up, you understand, right. But you got the, the core of the story, right. You, you flipped it on its head and you gave the woman dressed as a man, the lead role. And then you incorporated something in our history that maybe not a lot of people are aware of. And you brought that to light. So that's the power of being a writer. You can expose people to things that sometimes get left out of history through historical fiction. And that's the truth of the matter. So I know when I sent over the interview questions, you said research was an enormous part of writing this book. Now, tell me about that, because it all started with a Facebook photo post that someone sent to you. So you probably had to dive deep. I mean, I'm sure you had some information, but like you had to dive into this to get to tease out what you needed to write for this book. So talk to us about your research. Right. Well, First of all, I went online to see mm -hmm. what was available. I purchased a couple of books that were written about them. There wasn't very much. There wasn't very much there. But I happened to luck out mm -hmm. in that the Coast Guard had written a confidential report after the end of the war. And that had been now released. Mm -hmm. So I was able to get a copy, order a copy of that actual report. Wow. So I had information right from the Coast Guard about what they did and, and how they did it. I found a few articles that I was able to use. The Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut has a library and they will send you stuff. Cool. You know, they did send me things that I could, that I could use for references and I happened to have a friend who was the head of the Coast Guard in New York, in New York, on the New York Harbor, which is a big, big job. And so I was able to talk to him too. 
So sometimes your resources are going to be in book form, sometimes on the internet, sometimes they're going to be face-to-face -face talking to people. Now, I wanted to mention something else about research that I found out about the horses. When they put the initial call out across the country to horsemen across the country, they asked them to bring their own horses, but most of them did not. They didn't want to bring their own horses. They horse. want to bring their personal horse to a war <laughs> situation. They didn't situation. want to bring their personal horses. I imagine. In a, what could have been a combat situation. That's fascinating. Wow. I know. I mean, just think, if you had a champion show jumper, are you going to bring that horse and let him get shot? Or even just the like the bond you have with your you know trusted steed that you've had with you your entire life you know whether yeah. they're champion or not like the relationship I have with my horse is so special. However, it, that is actually interesting too because I know I could trust my horse to take me right. into a situation like that. So it's really interesting. I, I can see both sides uh -huh. of that. So they didn't well, want to bring I their horses. Was, I, and of course, you had jockeys. Most jockeys aren't riding their own horses. Right. And Rodeo cowboys, <laughs> they have horses, but anyway, they most of them, very few brought their own horses. In my story, Jane does bring her own horse. Oh. So you've got that bond going on there. Mm -hmm. But they got the horses from the army. You know, at that time, we still had remount posts like um, in Fort Robinson in Nebraska, where the army was still breeding and training horses. So the rest, almost all of the horses came from the army. Rifles, ammunition, ro radios, all those, that kind of equipment also came from the army. The Coast Guard provided the uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> and then they also provided the facilities where they trained and then they were in charge of dispersing. They set, it, they set up the, the country in zones Mm -hmm. And they dispersed their riders to the different zones so they could cover the areas that needed to be covered. And it was the Sam Pounder's job to look for submarines or ships and to report it. They were not supposed to engage in battle. They were supposed to report. They were supposed to report any people who seemed to be trying to sneak into, into the country by way of the shore, by the way of the ocean. That is Fascinating. I mean, you must have, I can tell how lit up you are by this book. I mean, that must have been really fun uncovering the history of this. That and it's a story that hasn't been told, I don't think, that frequently. Yeah. This is a story that horse lovers would love to know. So I'm sure diving into that research was really fun and interesting for you. It was really interesting for me. The other thing that I wanted to mention is when you're doing research for historical fiction, you need to write as though you're in that time period. Mm. Little things like picking the names for your characters. You know, we have names now that are real popular. Like Apple? That, that weren't used <laughs> in 1940. Right. You know, you, you have to pick names that would fit. So I have Jane. Jane was a name popular in the 40s. Mm -hmm. Jeannie is her best friend. Now this you'll get a kick out of. I picked her her partner and future love interest. I don't want to be a spoiler, but I picked her um, partner. They rode in pairs. Okay. Sand pounders were assigned in pairs. So her partner was, I named him Stefan Peters, Ooh. who is a famous U.S. dressage champion. But he came from Europe. His name is spelled S-T-E-F-F. A N that wouldn't have been done in the forties that I could find anywhere. So I spelled it the way Stefan S T E P H A N the way it was, I could find it spelled in the forties. So there are little details like that, that you need to be aware of language. You know, there, there were words that we use now that they didn't use mm -hmm. in the forties. And slang was different too, then also. So you have to do that sort of research and how, so how do you get, how do you wrap your head around that sort of stuff, like slang? And do you just dive into the internet and look for those things or is it in your reading? You can go on the internet. You can say, you can like, you can type in um, popular words in 19, I mean, names in 1940. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, it's amazing. What, what do we do before the internet? <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> okay. The last time we talked to each other, 
I know that you were working on a screenplay for one of your books and this one sounds like it could be an incredible screenplay and going back to what you said at the beginning of the the conversation that's another way to expand your creativity right taking on a different you know area of writing which is the screenplay and writing screenplays is completely different than <laughs> writing a novel it is you have to you have to get into, including blocky instructions, mm -hmm. 120 pages maximum. Yeah, well, the big difference is in a novel, you can internalize, you can express what they're feeling, you can go inside their head. Mm -hmm. But for a screenplay, it's all what you see. The actor has to portray those feelings with their facial expressions and their body language. But that's not the case when you're writing a novel. Mm -hmm. But the screenplay that was written is for, to In the Heart of a Mustang, which is, I mentioned, a contemporary coming of age novel. And the screenplay was actually picked up by a producer. Fantastic. I was going to say, yeah. is there an update? Yeah. I haven't heard anything more. That happened before. COVID hit mm. and then everything in the movie industry just kind of shut down. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, and, so, and, and screenplays and working with producers and getting a movie to film is a long game. This producer was saying that he, he was going to start working on funding, that kind mm. of thing. Mm -hmm. But then COVID hit and I haven't heard a word since. In the interim, this did win a big screenplay award, which is nice. But writing a screenplay is completely different, <laughs> and it's hard for me. It's just like writing a picture book because it's you have to it has to be a thousand words or less, mm -hmm. and I'm used to writing sixty five, seventy thousand words, so that's hard for for somebody like me. But that's good for your your mind and your creativity to be able to expand and then come back and shorten it up, but also look from different perspectives like how is this when someone's reading it inside their how do I make the movie in their mind but then you strip it down because it is your intellectual property you can make it so many different versions of itself and you own it so how right. did you get yourself in the mindset for the screenplay did you work with another I was working writer? with a professional screenwriter okay that must have helped. and we worked together went back and forth back and forth mm -hmm. And she kind of made me do it right. <laughs> she, she would chop out a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah and which I've heard is, is very, it's very difficult for an author to do oh, that, to chop things I mean, out. What's yeah. the hardest thing for us to write? In the back. <laughs> I know the back of the book description is very, yeah, it is challenging. Yeah. We, and we have to narrow it down to two paragraphs. <laughs> That's really hard. Oh, I agree with you. Yeah, I work with my editor to come up with the back of the book description because I can't take, I'm, I'm with you. You can't take, I don't know, what does it wind up being like 80,000 words or more uh -huh. and squish it into two paragraphs. That's compelling at the same time, right? Because we like to create the movie in the mind. So it, it's tough to do in two paragraphs. So when you're writing a novel, you are painting a picture mm -hmm. in your reader's mind. So you have to use all the senses, not on every paragraph, but you have to bring that reader into the world that you're creating through sight, smell, touch, what they're hearing, what they're seeing, what they're smelling, all these senses. On a screenplay, it's different because the screenplay is written for people to see. Mm -hmm. To just look at all that and all that's kind of provided for them mm -hmm. so it, it's much much different that's interesting so are you thinking about maybe doing it again with the sand pounder I mean I can see Hollywood jumping all over this one because everybody loves the horse you know war movies like those are the ones that you know horse racing movies and then the ones about horses at war are generally the ones that tend to be made well I think well you know I haven't had gotten that far in terms of thinking about it. <laughs> my brain really is one of a novelist uh, not a screenwriter yeah and so it, you know it takes somebody pushing me mm -hmm. to do it which is mm -hmm. what happened with in the heart of a mustang mm -hmm. and so it, you know if somebody i don't know 
I don't know. <laughs> if someone comes at you with a wedding crop and really wants it, you might consider it is what you're saying. <laughs> it's going to take a dressage whip, I'm afraid. Whip. <laughs> I love it. Dressage whip, getting after you. But, you know, <laughs> it's, it's neat that it's always out there and you've tried your hand at it, right? And you have a producer interested in the other screenplay. So it's yeah. almost like you got to kind of watch how much you bite off, right? Like maybe just stay there, see what's happening with production on that. Just keep pushing that one forward. And then if, you know, how things go, sometimes people come and they want to buy your book and then they send it to a screenwriter, right? So there's a lot of possibilities. That has happened to people, has, has, ha has happened to people. Yeah. But you know, there's a lot of World War II movies, mm -hmm. but they've really focused on Europe or mm -hmm. Japan, mm -hmm. not what was happening to the citizens of the U.S. Right. And the lives they were living with the coupons and having to ration everything and washing their aluminum foil because they couldn't get new aluminum foil so they'd reuse it and wash it and, I mean there were a lot of things that I mentioned in the book about um, what the people in the U.S. were having to do to a support the war effort and b because they had no choice right yeah so and that that would be an interesting twist in terms of uh, reaching a different little different audience because it's not, a, there's not a bunch of guns and battles. One woman, they do find a dead body on the beach. And actually that account was yeah. historical fiction, literary license, right? <laughs> yes. The author's prerogative. That event was one of the things that I read about in that report from the Coast Guard that actually happened in Washington state. Mm. That event that I have in the book happening in Oregon actually happened in Washington. But it did happen where a Russian freighter crashes against the cliffs. They discover it because they find a woman's body on the beach and then they actually rescue the Russians who are on that freighter. So, wow. I mean, this story sounds phenomenal. I mean, and, and I imagine as you've written 20 books, you've grown exponentially as a writer. Like, what would you say? Like, what advice would you give to yourself when you were just starting out, knowing now what you know? I have a whole author presentation, a two-hour presentation that I put together for writers' conferences. Oh, awesome. Titled, what I wish I had known before I wrote my first book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can we pick three, top three points from that two-hour presentation? Because, yeah, I'm sure there's plethora of things that we all wish we had known at the beginning but are there three vital tips that you could share with listeners who are just starting out on their journey or are kind of in the middle and are like oh do I keep going like when is success you know is there ever success you know how many books do I need to write or people who are looking to build their backlist what would you tell them okay well number one suggestion I have for you if you want to write is do not quit writing after the first chapter, hmm. I have so many people who come up to me and say, oh, I started to write a book and I got stuck on the first chapter and I kept going back trying to make it perfect. And I said, that was your problem. Hmm. If you want to get a book done, you need to sit down and write it, write it, write it, write it, write it, write it. And get to the very end before you ever look back. Mm -hmm. Because until you get the first draft done, that's just your first draft. You've all been to school. You know what a first draft is. You don't have anything but an idea in your head. Mm -hmm. But you've got to get that first draft done to have your foundation. Mm -hmm. That's the foundation of your book. Then you can go back and start building upon that foundation. You can embellish, you can expand areas, you can take out things that don't seem to make any sense, you know, but you've got to get the first draft done. Then you go back. Now, for example, my first drafts of a book that ends up being about 65,000 words, you need to know industry standards too. I mean, there's so much I could say, <laughs> but industry standards for a young adult book is generally between 50 to 70,000 words. Mm -hmm. So I aim for about 65,000 words. Well, my first draft is only about 45,000 words. 
But when I go back over and over and over, first draft, second draft, third draft, fourth draft, each time it gets a little bigger until by the end, I've got about 65,000 words. Mm -hmm. Or actually, then you have more and then you start cutting out stuff that you didn't <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I feel like it's easier to add than for remove. But yes, I, I, I agree with you. Don't look back. Keep going forward. Right. You, know, you kind of you know have an idea of where you want to go, but go forward because that's where I notice a lot of authors get like held up is they keep going they back do. and editing and editing and editing, editing a editing. chapter and you never keep going forward. You just got to keep never barreling go forward. forward. You've got to just get that whole thing down. Now, I don't. Okay, sorry, creative writing teachers that I've had in the past. <laughs> I don't outline, create the whole story in my head, usually mm -hmm. while I'm riding my horse up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. I create the whole story in my head. And when I have it where I have the beginning, middle, end, and I'm comfortable with what I've got in my head, not to say it doesn't change a lot, but I've got the story in my head, that's when I start writing. And I write the whole first draft before ever looking back. Okay, that's my tip number one. If you want to get a book done. I would Second, argue too that, out, that you are outlining, but you're just keeping it in your head. You're not putting it down on paper. Right. because I don't I, put it down on paper. Yeah, but you have and, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, mm -hmm. that, and that helps write a good arc to a story. You are technically outlining. You're just not like putting it on a piece of paper where it's next to your table when you're when you're writing your stories. That's so, true. That's there good are, I mean, everybody has their own writing style. Yeah. And some authors really just sit down and free write. Mm -hmm. They have no idea where they're going. <laughs> they sit down and they start writing whatever flows out of their head. Yeah. I'm not like that. No. I'm more organized than that. I, hold, I know who my characters are going to be. I know where they're going to come into the story and why, you know, I have that figured out already. But everybody has their own style. But I'm also not a formula writer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the creative writing class, you're going to get a formula yes. that you're supposed to follow. I don't do that. I'm, I'm a little more free. I write, I write in a very linear fashion mm -hmm. that's true but I don't follow a formula you're writing the story that you've visualized in your mind that right. is the beginning a middle and an end which is right. and, to, and you're having a tons of success you're like a multi-award winning author and, and I think yeah. it's true that you said you know it's everybody has a different writing style it's a creative endeavor you know mm -hmm. there it you can't I don't know, it's not like doing a math problem. Yeah, there's formulas to telling stories that people are attracted to, and you can look at that stuff. But when you're writing your own story and you're an author, there is a way we all do it, and it, every single person does it differently. You know, right. there is no one way. So yeah. it's like creating art or a painting, or even like you said, you get six horsewomen in a room and they all have a different opinion <laughs> on how things are done. It's the same thing with authors. <laughs> that's that's for sure. Yeah. Now, my probably second tip would be always hire a professional editor. Oh, 100%. You cannot edit your own work. Mm -hmm. Your brain knows the story too well. You skip over things. You miss typos. Now, I have seen air typos in Random House. The biggest New York publishers, they do miss things occasionally. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to be, you know, too hard on missing one or two typos. But when you are trying to do it yourself, you're going to miss way too much. Mm -hmm. So, and you also, because the story makes sense to you, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make sense to your reader. So I use beta readers that, and generally I have beta readers that know something about the subject. And then I use professional editors. Mm -hmm. So, and even the professional editors will miss something once in a while. So definitely. Yeah. It's like the more eyes you can get on things, things with people you trust before publication, the more likely you are to catch things, you know, in right. more, in, in the more I go over things or the more the author goes over things, you, you miss it because you've spent so much time with it. Yeah. So, yeah. And then edit your editors, do you use editors that have knowledge of horses because there's no not necessarily no my, no my beta readers I use some that have knowledge of horses okay you know horses so you don't have to worry about 
catching non-force related wrongness, like hooking the lunge line to their up at the top of their halter or stuff like that. Like you, you get that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> That's true. But uh, no, I know all that horse stuff pretty well. But the uh, editors that I hire are looking for grammar, mm. punctuation, sentence mm-hmm. structure. Now there's soft edits, which are those, you know, just, oh, you missed a typo here and you misspelled this word. And then there's hard edits, which are plotting characterization. Mm-hmm. I don't usually have problems with that. That seems to be a strength for me. So usually my edits, my corrections are the soft edits, you know. Mm-hmm. Once in a while, I get a run on sentence or once in a while, I'll switch point of view. Uh, yeah. And that's very easy to do mm-hmm. when, you, when you're trying to develop two characters, in particular, like with Jane and Stefan. You don't want to switch point of view unless you have a scene change or a chapter break. And so it's easy to do that. So if you, you know, those kinds of things are what will get caught by the editor Mm -hmm. so one start at the beginning and just go and it's okay to have a crummy first draft just get your first draft right two always work with a professional editor and advanced readers that you trust uh to make to you because you can't see things anymore okay you got one more tip for us things you wish you had done yeah my third tip would be and if you're going to market your book you need to figure out who your audience is Hmm. Who are you writing this book for? Are, you know, Percy is written for three to six-year-olds. But three to six-year-olds, this is the problem with marketing. Three to six-year-olds can't buy the book. Right. It's parents or grandparents that will buy the book. So which parents or grandparents are going to buy this book? Generally, it's people like you and me who want to indoctrinate our children and grandchildren <laughs> loving horses. Yes. <laughs> That's so, so right. We want to we want to brainwash them young. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's right. But um, you need to know who your audience is and who you're writing it for. That holds true with any genre that you're writing in terms of the words you're going to choose. I just reviewed a book for someone. They asked me to review it for them. And it was written almost in a juvenile fashion. It was very juvenile. And then they throw in some word that even I had to look up. And mm-hmm. I read a lot. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, no, 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 no. <laughs> got to be consistent. Your audience is junior high kids. They're not going to know this. I can't even remember the word. I mean, it was just a bizarre, huge word. <laughs> it meant very beautiful. Well, and, and don't they say, too, that most most people like like to read, whether they can or cannot, but like to read at like a sixth grade level is yes. that like the industry standard yeah yes that is and in fact the average american reads at an eighth grade level okay yeah i knew it was like somewhere right around what in do there. we like to do for just recreational reading mm-hmm. it's like a sixth grade level mm-hmm. so you want to aim and there are there are websites that you can use that can rate your your writing so you know what age group it's written for but you've got to target that audience and keep your mind on who that audience is Now, mine are written for young adults who like horses. Mm -hmm. But what I found is a ton of adults, even adult book clubs, buy these books and read them. Because as you say, it's recreational reading. And so young adult is very popular with adults. But I don't use a New York Times young adult definition because I don't use any bad words or any sex (laughs) at all. And I try to teach good moral values in my books without being too preachy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm really trying to leave something good in the world. But my audience is young adults. So where are those, if in terms of marketing, where are they going to be? I do school visits, for one. And I do presentations on on my favorite writing tips to... uh, like, for example, I next week I'm going to a junior high and talking about my favorite writing tips. Those are my audience. I go to horse events. A couple of weeks ago, I went to the Mustang and Burrow Festival up in Estes <laughs> Park, Colorado. Sold a ton of books because who was there? 
horse people of all ages, including those grandparents who want to brainwash their grandkids. The next week, I went to the Western Airs annual big show extravaganza at the National Western Stock Show facility. Sold a ton of books because who was there? Horse people. people. love horses of yeah. all ages. Mm -hmm. So you've got to target who your audience is. Now, if you're writing romance, who's your target audience? Women and book clubs. Mm -hmm. That's who your target audience is. So if you want to sell those books, you're going to try to get to the library, find out book clubs in your area and contact them and offer to come and speak. You know, so you've got to reach your audience where your audience is. So for me, it's school visits or course events uh, or Christmas festivals. Another question I have for you. I mean, you are 20 books deep. And I know we talked about longevity early on, and it's trying a lot of different genres and just looking at what you're interested in, but also staying true to what you're passionate about, which is obviously in your case, courses in you know some of this historical elements but you also have fantasy out there what would you say to an author who is maybe a few books in and is just like now what how would you encourage your younger self to keep going after book one two three four like how did you how did you keep yourself motivated to keep writing one thing that I have been fortunate about is that the critics have really liked my work. Mm. I have submitted my work to literary awards programs. And you want to submit to a few so that maybe you'll win one. <laughs> you know, well, I've been fortunate to win almost every time, first, second, or third, almost every time. So that is the validation that I'm on the right track and that I'm writing well. Mm. Not to say I don't keep trying to get better and better all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. but that I'm doing something right. So I can stand up in front of a group of people and talk confidently about my books and know that they are going to be well-received by anybody who chooses to read it. So that's a, good, that's a good thing. So building up your confidence as a writer, we are our own worst critics. Totally. And you have got to silence that negative voice in your brain that tells you you're not good enough. You can't do this. You know, and if your first work is not good, which sometimes it isn't, then keep working at it. Mm -hmm. Take classes. I take, I still take writing classes, take classes, get critical reviews, keep trying to improve your skill. But you have to realize at the same time that, oh, what do they say? An average of 2,700 books are published a day in the U.S. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why if you can narrow down your audience mm -hmm. a little and be clear who your audience is, don't just say, oh, I'm writing a book for everybody. They're going to all love this book. Mm -hmm. No, they aren't going to all love it. Who is it that's really going to like your book? Mm -hmm. And that's who you focus. Any marketing dollars you spend should be on that audience or any efforts. Maybe they aren't marketing dollars. Maybe they're just personal appearances or submitting your book to for reviews to different magazines. Uh, I have found basically newspapers. They're not worth anything anymore. You probably found this, Carly. <laughs> You know, they're good for wrapping fish. That's kind of all. Most people aren't reading newspapers anymore. That's but true. magazines, for example, Blaze Magazine is a horse, kids' horse magazine. And they always put post reviews of my books. Wow. Because they trusted me. Yeah. I built up a reputation with them as being a quality product producer mm -hmm. and so they will always put a feature of my book in their magazines so and there are other magazines you know horse periodicals that you could focus on if you were writing for the horse community mm -hmm. real really it's create a good product build good relationships in your community know your audience and target the right people way to break through the noise especially with this many books being published is to 
really, really dig deep in who are, who is the right audience for this book. Right. So, so I think you just offered some really smart advice and keep going, right? Because write, writing is like writing. There's always something more to learn. You can always improve upon your craft. And I'll tell you, there's nothing like writing that first book. If you're being called forward, do it. Like, I think there's a statistic out there that like 80% of people say they want to write a book and only like 3% ever do. So if you write a book, you've only, you you only have room to grow because once you do it, you know, you can do it. Right. But you're always improving upon your craft, just like you're always improving upon your riding your horse. Right. Yeah. And you can't be too thin skinned about (laughs) <laughs> totally that's great advice. you've got to be willing to improve mm-hmm. um, your writing and your first book may not be very good my first fiction book was the mist trilogy mm-hmm. and behind the mist and it was picked up by a, pu- a traditional publisher but their editor had a lot of criticism for me mm-hmm. and if I said no this is my book and I'm going to do it just like this yeah I wasn't going to get any better. I take every criticism and I try to take that seriously mm-hmm. and improve whatever it is they're, they're talking about. So I remember my one book, I have a couple of books that are not horse books and one's a middle grade fantasy called North Mystic. And it's an allegory of the Revolutionary War. And, and it I submitted it to several publishers and one publisher wrote back and said, yes, they're interested, but I send the whole manuscript. I sent them the whole manuscript. And then they wrote back a while later and turned it down. But unlike most publishers, that editor sent me a two-page, single-spaced critique of the book. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. You'd pay so much money for that. Yeah. And here I was getting all this free advice Mm -hmm. about what they liked and why they didn't take it. Mm -hmm. And I took every one of those, why they didn't take it. And I changed the manuscript and it, I ended up having three different publishers fighting over that book. Well, you've got to be willing to say, okay, I can get better. I can change things now. It goes both ways, too, because there are times when you need to say no, like Pinto, for example. Pinto is written like Black Beauty, Mm. written from the point of view of the only horse to complete this 20,000 mile journey. And I pitched it in front of an agent and the agent said she wanted the book, but I would have to include a child on this journey a child that was not there, in order for them to market it to middle grade and young adults, they wanted, they wanted to market it like black, well, the same age as Black Beauty, which they rank as nine and up. And she said, but nobody wants to tell a story from the animal's point of view. And I'm going, two problems. Have you ever heard of Charlotte's Web? Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of Babe? Have you know all of these stories that are written from the animal's point of view? that are, some of them are classics, including Black Beauty. Mm -hmm. And second, I had to stay true to that story. I was using a real event that happened, just telling it from the horse's point of view. But I was reading their journals and those men did not have a kid on this journey with them. That would also almost be sick. Right, it was like, it was a rugged trip. It was- It was a rugged trip and those four men nearly starved to death they could barely feed themselves, let alone have another kid come along. (laughs) And so there are times where you have to say, no, I actually know better. And that book has won a dozen literary awards. So I was right in that case. Yeah. And you know, it was wrong. And I feel like your gut sometimes knows, right? So, so good. I mean, again, it's all subjective. It's like, this is such a crazy space to work inside of. And, you know, it's, you have to stick to your guns in some places you have to be able to accept the feedback in some places, but you also have to be able to say, no, I don't, I don't take that feedback because I know that's not the right direction here. So it's yeah. like, it's almost like you just got to trust your intuition and right. some of these decisions and what advice you take and what you don't and what feedback you take and what you don't, but you should, you should definitely be open to receiving 
feedback, right? So that's right. that's another Definitely great piece of open. advice. And examine it and learn from it one way or the other. Yep. And, and you're and, you're a prime and, example of that. You've been doing your 20 books in and, and you're winning awards and you're out there speaking on behalf of the art of writing and you're, you know, you are putting good in the world, uh, MJ. And I really appreciate all that you do. And I love this conversation that we're having. You have shared so much awesome information. One final question before we wrap up, what's next? Like you just put this next book in the world. What's next? Did you have an idea bubbling up yet? Or are you just kind of waiting for the muse to hit you and inspire you? No, I already am already starting research on my next book. Awesome. That's so great. <laughs> and the book is actually going to be another World War II story. Oh. But uh, many of you have heard of General Patton and his involvement in rescuing the Lipizzan stallions mm -hmm. from being eaten by the Russian army mm -hmm. during World War II. Many people, I mean, Disney made a movie about it. Mm -hmm. There have been a few books written about it. But what most people don't know is that it wasn't just the Lipizzans from Vienna that were stolen by the Nazis in their attempt to create a perfect horse. You know, they wanted the perfect race of people. They were also one of the perfect war horse. They also took the Arabians, the pride and joy of Poland. Mm -hmm. And so my story is going to be on one of those horses. I just spent $94 to get an out of print book that was written about one of these Polish Arabians that was taken out of Poland. And that's, but I'm also intertwining a story about a boy who has autism, but it was before we knew what autism was. Oh, cool. I love that part. element. Yeah. So I'm putting that element in because horses are such healers for autistic kids. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting that element into it. So it's going to be historical fiction again, but it's going to be set in Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. during World War II with this Polish Arabian that is taken out of Poland. Oh, fantastic. I am so excited. I love how your mind works. Thank you for like, like pulling, pulling it back and like sh pulling the curtains back and sharing all this great information with us and talking to us about how your author's mind works. Like, this was such a fascinating conversation. Congratulations on the Sand Pounder. And I, I'm excited. This is this is a cool story to be told. And it, there's not a lot of information out there. I've never heard about this as a horse lover my entire life. So I know. Thank, you, thank you for bringing it to light. Where, MJ, can people find more information about you and all of your books, but most importantly, your newest one, The Sand Pounder? Well, if they go to my website, which is www.dancinghorsepress.com, the first page is just kind of my blog, my running blog of news and things that are going on. And then there's a section on my books, and each has a little synopsis. And then there's a, a store where people can actually buy the books, and I autograph them. And unlike if they're sold on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, I never see them. Right. But if they're sold through the website, I actually get to autograph them and mail them on. Great gifts. <laughs> Great gifts. Great gifts. And then there's also a section on about me that has a little bit about, about me. <laughs> yeah. And, and you're, you're on Facebook, right? You're on uh -huh. Facebook. I have a Facebook account, Margie Evans, mm -hmm. 98. And then I have... Instagram, and I have Twitter. But people can probably get to all those places through your website, but I'll make sure to link to all the places where you can connect with MJ uh, and buy her books and check out her great work. And MJ, I look forward to seeing you again soon in the future. It's been far too long. And thank you. I for know we back need to see show. each other in person. I know. I want to give you a big, I'm giving I you a know. big virtual hug right now. <laughs> That's right. Hugs back. Yay. <laughs> but thank you for the gift of your time and for coming back on the show and sharing all this with us today. Well, thank you for giving me your time and for interviewing me. I hope what I said was helpful to someone. It will be. I totally know it. Thanks for joining us this week on the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I hope you enjoy these Q&A sessions with wonderful equine authors who love all things horses and writing, just like me. Visit my website, carlycadecreative.com, where you can read the show notes and make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you so much for your support. Want a free guide to secrets of horse book authors? 
Gallop over to carlykadecreative.com forward slash wisdom to have author advice delivered instantly to your inbox. If you are an author who writes about horses and would like to be spotlighted, please let me know. Visit my contact page at carlykadecreative.com to fill out a request. I'd be happy to have you on the show too. Thank you for tuning in to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. See you next time. I'm your host, Carly Cade. Creative writing makes my spurs jingle.